Welcome to APUSH. Today we're going to discuss new nativism, which is different from old nativism in that we dislike different groups of foreigners this time because there's different groups of foreigners showing up. So that's super exciting. Here are your basic, uh, here are your basic objectives, so make sure you can absorb them, and let's get ready to look at a bunch of really racist stuff about different groups of foreigners. So. We get this wave of new immigration in the late Gilded Age. We, of course, hopefully remember that previous sources of immigration had led to consternation in the United States, you know, going all the way back to uh, when Puritan migration was disrupted back in the mid 1600s, leading to uh, chaos, unrest, and uh, of course, the trial of dangerous witches. But of course, we're seeing another a huge immigration wave here during this time period. Admittedly, not as big as the one around the First World War, but still pretty substantial. And what we're seeing is these immigrants are coming from different places, whereas previously our immigrants were coming primarily from Ireland and Germany, especially after the whole crisis of the, the springtime of the peoples in uh, 1848 and those waves of scary new immigrants were coming in. Now it's even scarier groups of people. For example, we see a bunch of people coming in from Southern and Eastern Europe, which obviously problematic. And these terrifying groups of people coming in from not Europe, which, as you know, is going to lead to huge amounts of problems on account of their lack of Europeanness. So let's talk about these different groups and what the responses to them were. Obviously, as you see over time, even within Europe, the movement from Northern and Western Europeans to Southeastern Europeans is going to be pretty stark here, and this is going to be problematic for, um, for Americans because Northwestern Europeans tended to be Protestant and, uh, and generally British, whereas Southern and Eastern Europeans were often Catholic, and this was very worrisome to people for the same reasons that we were worried about the Catholics coming in uh, during 1848. So what you start to see are these different immigration waves. And we've talked previously about push factors and pull factors, you know, the Irish potato famine and political unrest in Europe. Well, we're seeing now unrest from the unification of Germany, the unification of Italy, uh, Russification and nationalization in Russia, and the chaos associated with the Opium Wars and the Taiping Rebellion in China. So all of these are going to lead to new waves of immigrants showing up. And obviously, the pull factor of these groups of people coming in is substantial opportunities in the United States, both, of course, in the West, in mining, and then, of course, in urban areas of the North with the, uh, industri the second industrial revolution booming and the demand for labor skyrocketing. So all of this, of course, leads to new nativism in which uh, we're scared of new groups of native people, but rather than racist caricatures of Irish and German people, we get racist caricatures of Jewish people. Look, look at all these things he's bringing with us. Turns out he's coming here because he doesn't have any money. What a disaster. The irony, of course, of this is as a nation of immigrants arguing that the next group of immigrants is inherently un-American and can never assimilate uh, is somewhat problematic. Uh, we'll probably have you break down this uh, political cartoon in class because it's, uh, it's, it's pretty poignant, but the message hopefully is pretty clear. <laughs> <coughs> Excuse me. And of course, we're worried about the religious affiliation of these different immigrant groups. And one of the groups to step up and defend us is the Klan, who becomes staunchly anti-immigrant in addition to their anti-Northern, anti-Republican, anti-African-American previous uh, opinions. And so you can count on the Klan to always hate the new group of people coming in and to adjust their bigotry to match changing demographic situations within the United States. We get a whole bunch of uh, more or less caricatures of these foreigners, which, of course, super problematic. Oh, here's a newspaper basically arguing that Italians are degenerate criminals and that they should all be dumped in the in the ocean. So that that's a thing. There's also this divide within immigrant communities. As, of course, significant amounts of nativism make immigrants want to assimilate as quickly as is possible. And so there's this idea of... Uh, of greenhorns being a recently arrived immigrants and how immigrants worked very hard to try to shed that greenhorn label as early as is possible. 
Uh, for example, uh, my grandmother, when her family came here, worked very hard to get rid of her uh, Norwegian accent. Her parents spoke Norwegian at home because uh, she was worried about getting teased on the playground for it. And so she got rid of her Norwegian accent and forbade her sons to learn Norwegian because she didn't want them to suffer the same type of discrimination that she had faced when she came. And so there's this real tension between recently arrived immigrants as far as what degree they try to keep their traditional ethnic and cultural identity versus to what degree they throw this out and assimilate. And of course, over time, this is something that is going to, go, is going to clearly happen. People become more assimilated over time. But I mean, there's also some measures of traditional cultural practices that, uh, you know, people undertake. For example, you know, my family, despite being, you know, having been here for multiple generations, still has some traditional Scandinavian holiday practices, eat some traditional Scandinavian foods and, you know, celebrate our heritage in that way. Most immigrants lived in cities and specifically immigrant city life was relatively rough because they often had to live in sort of the poorest and least well-developed areas of the city, generally in sort of hastily constructed housing to make up for the fact that there was this massive boom of people moving in. And so they would move into these sort of immigrant enclaves areas in which there were other people of their same sort of ethnicity in order to try to limit the cultural language and uh, sort of other barriers that immigrants would face. And generally, they would also be integrated into the political machines, as we talked about before. So immigrants would be national naturalized and be made citizens almost immediately, because of course, there were no requirements for this at that time. And for political machines, it was, of course, very beneficial to have someone waiting down at the docks when immigrants show up to help them get settled, help them get jobs, help them get registered to vote, because then you can count on that immigrant group showing up for you at the polls and keeping you in power. And so we talked about this when we talked about urban political machines, but it's important to tie this in here and to show sort of how the all of these things are interconnected together. Immigrants also played a huge role on in, in increasing the infrastructure of the United States, specifically building things like the Brooklyn Bridge. Obviously, these, these types of construction pro projects are very, very difficult and super expensive. And so if you can get low cost immigrant labor to build them, you could cut costs significantly and still increase the, uh, the infrastructure and the uh, amenities that these cities have. So we get immigrants working on stuff like that. Uh, on, on mining, of course, and railroad construction, and, and the sewer system in New York City, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Immigrants generally lived in tenement housing, which were very hastily constructed apartments, generally very, very small and cramped with very few amenities. Uh, these, these dumbbell tenements were generally packed together and built relatively tall using new construction techniques uh, and incorporating new materials such as steel. So we start to get cities building upward in order to, to uh, compensate for the fact that the population is rising substantially. And obviously, you can't get more land within these cities, so you build up. The dumbbell tenement, as we mentioned before, is the standard sort of layout here. And you can see it's really, really small. But you do get some private living space. Uh, that fire escapes were eventually added, so that's good. And there's theoretically a public bathroom that you could use on the floor. And so not the greatest of living uh, conditions, but at least uh, filling, fitting people's needs to some degree. <coughs> and obviously sanitation was an important uh, component of this because as you just heard, the plague could spread relatively quickly through these areas. Cholera and other respiratory diseases are a clear problem if you don't have adequate sanitation. And so, and obviously uh, we weren't totally comfortable with germ theory yet. And so treating these diseases was very difficult. And so how do we stop massive cholera outbreaks? Well, we get a bunch of Im immigrants to help build the massive storm sewer in New York. And so you start digging out tunnels underneath cities and getting more complex public water systems in order to get clean supplies of water and to get rid of wastewater. And so the way that we sort of picture cities now really emerged during this time period, both because of the influx of immigrant labor and the requirements of these substantially increasing populations. And so all of that comes together to build the sort of modern cities that we're used to seeing today.
Obviously, a lot of people pushed back against this immigration and argued that these immigrants were taking jobs away from Americans, which you know, maybe. But we started to get groups like the Immigration Restriction League, who uh, wanted to push back against these new immigrants who could never truly become real Americans. I mean, seriously, can you imagine an Italian people, an Italian person, truly becoming American? I mean, they're just so different from like a a German or a English person. Immigrant processing facilities like Ellis Island usually were uh, somewhat dehumanizing experiences. Of course, Angel Island on the West Coast. Immigrants were screened, often given pseudoscientific intelligence tests, uh, screened for diseases in very, again, unsystematic ways, and sometimes excluded for very questionable reasons. But if you were able to get through, of course, and get processed, you could then become a citizen and have... Uh, and see and seek out a better life for yourself and your family. So there's balance here to some degree. Except for the Chinese, of course, who were formally excluded first in 1882, then renewed in 1892, and eventually we just decided we're just banning all Asians by the 1820s. Uh, the reasons uh, to, that we pushed back against the Chinese was mostly racism. Well, not mostly racism, exclusively racism. Uh, obviously, the Chinese are Asian as opposed to European, and so a lot of racist stereotypes sort of showed up here. And and then, of the course, you had a, a very large wave of Chinese immigrants coming in as the Qing dynasty began to collapse under the pressure of European imperialism and internal pressure. And so because of this, especially on the West Coast, you got very strong anti-Asian sentiment, uh, giving rise to a bunch of our racist stereotypes, and Chinese people were excluded. Uh, the interesting thing, or one of the interesting things, at least to me, is that there were a few exceptions for getting around the Chinese Exclusion Act, uh, and it was mostly taking jobs that white people didn't want to take. And so if you were willing to like open a laundromat or uh, open a restaurant, you were generally allowed in uh, despite the Chinese Exclusion Act. And so one of the reasons that Chinese food is so ubiquitous in the United States is because one of the ways that Chinese people could get around harsh immigration restrictions was opening restaurants. And then, of course, they took some Chinese cooking techniques and, and uh, foods and flavors and adapted it to American tastes to give us the, uh, the Chinese American food that we know and love today. So uh, I'm not going to say a benefit of the Chinese Exclusion Act. I'm just going to say an effect of it. And then, of course, pseudoscientific nonsense like social Darwinism was used to talk about certain races being superior, other races being inferior, and we should exclude the inferior races. And most, and as always with these racial hierarchies, the whiter you are, the better. And uh, yeah, all of this was used to justify, you know, pretty, pretty racist policies. So that brings us to the end of new nativism. So hopefully you can uh, respond to these things in some detail. And when we come back, we'll finish out our unit with the rise of the populist party and the and American politics being re sort of structured again, setting up the stage for the progressive era next unit.